recording. Awesome. Hey guys, this is um, me, I'm Patrick, nice to see you guys. Uh, I'm going to be talking about something called Newton's method, which is an algorithm for trying to solve for solutions to different equations um, through a type of uh, algorithm which will hopefully lead us to the right solution. As I was saying, before my um, everything I learned here was during the summer with the help of Professor Scott Sutherland. I was doing an REU for that, and uh, let's get started. So what Newton's method is, is a type of algorithm which helps you get to the right root through an iterative process. So what you're doing is that you start with some initial value, x0, and then what you do is you take that, you search for where the function is, so you just get f of x, and then you follow the tangent line over that, up until where it is the x-axis, and that's your new x1. And what this is doing, ideally, there are issues with this, is that it kind of leads you through steps up until when you solve for the root, which in this case is 1, right? 1 minus 1 is 0. Uh, root is any value for which a function is going to output 0. So like f of 1 here is going to be equal to Okay. Obviously there are different ways to do this. Like for example, this one's really simple to just offer this algebraically, but when you have polynomials that are a little more annoying, this becomes an issue or impossible to solve analytically. So that's why this exists to try to help combat that. Sorry for the talk. So a way to characterize how to solve these and what sets go into which solutions is to talk about basins. A basin is a set which here I've, um, has been color coded green. Is that any set here will get you to this root. Like let's say you start here. It's the same as in the previous image. You start here, you go there, and the tangent line, the derivative, is going to point you this way. You start here, and it points you, and it points you. And the same thing here. Anything here right after the critical point will lead you to the right, which will then access as a way to get into the root here. Does that make sense? Um, so right here kind of serves in the same way of taking you to a point, but then you, you calculate the tangent line, you go, and it leads you to here, and it kind of helps you hone in on this. So it's essentially all the points which will, when you take the limit of it being iterated with Newton's method, is going to get you to the root. So it takes you to the root zeta here, and then f of zeta is equal to zero. And then the connected basin is a subdomain of this, which is essentially the connected part of the domain. Here, this would be the connected basin, while this entire strip of green is also part of the basin for the root. Okay. Now, how do we derive Newton's method? Because I was talking about it as if it was an abstract idea, which is technically how you come up with these ideas is things that you, you desire, you want. So what do you want? You want an algorithm which will direct xi towards xi plus 1 by examining the slope at that point. So what we do is we're constantly checking what the value is, checking the derivative, and creating a tangent line that will take us to, a, ideally, a better point. So if you start with the definition of a line, and you're starting with that at x naught, f of x naught, and you want f of x to equal 0, you want the root, right? So you plug that in, you get 0 minus f of x naught is equal to the derivative at x naught times x1 minus x naught. And then after some algebraic changes, you get x1 is equal to x naught minus f of x naught over f prime of x naught. Meaning what? Meaning uh, you have your x. You plug it into this, and you get a better x, or hopefully better. Uh, okay, and by induction, you get the actual for, um, formulation for the algorithm. And this is just notation. This means after i iterations of it. Uh, cool. Does this make sense? Or am I just talking too quickly? Cool. I, I like head knots. Head knots are good. They make me feel like my words mean something. 
Okay. Now, extending this is a complex plane. Obviously, sometimes you do get issues with just Newton's method and so Like, let's say you're working and you have x squared plus 1. Well, obviously, you can't solve that using this method. You'll get, you start here, let's say, around negative 2 as your initial point. And you're going to go here, this point's here, go here, this point's here, go here, this point's here, and on and on. You will never actually get a root because there are no roots. This never does touch the x-axis. I mean, there are no roots in the real plane. So what you do is you can extend it to the complex plane. Here you have x to the fourth minus x as a function, which has two real roots, 0 and 1. But you don't actually get any access. There's no way to solve for the complex roots. So a way of helping to tackle this is by extending this to the complex plane here. And then you actually, this still works. It's still the same algorithm as before. Instead of x, you just have a z, which is um, a point in the complex plane. So here, obviously, this when this slip here, the zero, is still going to be the real axis. So that is why this still makes sense. Anything to the left of zero would still get you zero as the solution to the root using Newton's method, which is why all this is green. And here is also green up until it touches this, which is the critical point. Anything to the left of this critical point will shoot you here, and then you'll still get to the root at zero. However, anything to the right of it is going to get you to this root at one. When you extend this with a complex plane, you're inputting in, uh, complex numbers into it. So you would get other solutions as well. Here you would get the solution, the other two imaginary solutions that I took before my sense. I'm talking way too quickly, so is there anything I should slow down on or talk about again? Okay. Yeah, which is okay last So okay. Uh, there is a way to do the actual work and then using the Newton's method. Uh -huh. For the two parts that touch the x-axis, can you use Newton's method for that? Or do you go about it first doing algebraically, then you do the Newton's method? Uh, you mean so these two axes? Yeah. Oh, uh, well these you could use using Newton's method, or you could solve for it algebraically, but like to solve for this, if you were going to solve it algebraically, you would just get all the solutions. So sometimes the same you exact way as using the Newton's method to solve those two points. I don't understand. My, my question would yeah. be, so the Newton's uh, mm -hmm. method is for the ones not touching the x-axis. Oh, it's for all of them. For all of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you started here, you would still use Newton's method. You would get here, probably, if you're going to follow this example. And then here, and then here, and then you would get closer and closer to the root. Got it. Yeah. Good question. So if you... So let's look at some of the geometrical aspects of this, because these are pretty pictures. What the hell do they mean? Maybe they're just pretty pictures. No. Um, so given a polynomial, the roots of the, the, the roots, the points where the critical points are, is going to be within the convex hull. So what does that mean? Imagine that you have a rubber band. Um, is there anything right, right here? Mm -hmm. I don't know if people will see, but go ahead. So if you have right like, here, these are the roots. And I'm going to have critical points as x's. The critical points of the polynomial have to be within, if you were to stretch out a rubber band and put it here, it would kind of look like this, right? So the critical points can't be outside of it, but they have to be either like on it or inside. This is something known as the Gauss-Lucas theorem. And if you were to apply this again as taking the derivative of the polynomial as the new polynomial, then the roots of that have to, the roots of that derivative have to be inside of it. So you get the inflection points, so this becomes your new convex hull. The inflection points, which I'll have as pluses, have to be inside that. Which you see here actually, interestingly enough. It's not inside all of them, but for the convex hull of the roots, the critical points, which are hard to see here, but they're around the tips of these basins, are um, within the convex hull of the roots of the polynomial. So what does this mean? Well, sometimes it's hard to have uh, f of x as your, as something that's not a polynomial just because of how simple it is to solve for it if it's a polynomial. So you can try to replicate it with the polynomial if you have a theta series of it, or you just want to work with polynomials to see the nice geometry that it reflects. OK. Another interesting part is that if you notice, you have these as the roots. Based on how many critical points are connected to these roots, we, um, we are connected to the basins, that's how many inflection points there are, too. So this root, um, the basin of it is the green. 
nice, pretty green. And it has one, two, three, four, five inflection points because it has six critical points connecting to it. Connecting is a rough word to use. You just have to try to bear with me even though it's not very rigorous to find. Any questions on this? Okay. Cool. So this is a demonstration of how the critical points are affected by the positions of the roots. I mean, it's a cute little thing with Python. Um, so if you have your polynomial as this, this is just a fancy way of saying uh, points on the circle uh, that are reflected by where it is. So as you can see, if you follow, these are the roots. The critical points are always going to be within the convex a little bit. And all of them change slightly based on where they are. Cool. Does this make sense? Or uh, should I explain something else? Okay. Is everything alright? Okay. Cool. So, another thing to look at is varying the step size. So, up to this point, I was using kind of like the vanilla news method, which is characterized by having h equal to 1, so it's just z minus and then the rest of it. If you want to have it more accurate, in a sense, what you would do is um, make the step size smaller. So, normally, uh, you would have step size 1 here. And as you make the step size smaller, it actually, let me get on this, I hope nobody minds me. That's fine. That's fine? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you have here, you have like these little blips. That's because Newton's method is an iterative process, right? So these are kind of like pre-images all of this one. So here, these points, we go to these points, these points, these points, and then look at this. When is this undefined? At the critical point, right? So when the, the critical point is zero, this becomes a very large, close to zero, not zero, obviously. But if it's like f of the, you're super close to the critical point, meaning you know, f prime of zero is like 0 0.01, then this really blows up which means that once you're really close to the critical point, you get thrown really far away. That's why this is kind of like a red color, is that you go here, you start here, 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 and then it shoots you because you're so close to the critical point, all the way over here, and now you're in the basin of this root, connected basin of this root, which is why these are kind of like glimpse in color. And as you have a smaller step size, your point is more careful to not be thrown away, super far away. So that's why these get smaller. Here it's almost like very few points because very few points really do get close to this critical point in, that, in such a manner. And once you really get small, it almost becomes non-existent and it's just a smooth basin. This here is just a difference in how a step size of one versus a very small step size dramatically change, not dramatically, but like it changes how the actual basin looks like. So this here is just a difference between the points that were in different basins there and here, outlined in black. Also, something interesting is that it's not just a nice way of forming it. It's not just like smooth, where everything here, you know, try to this out. It's not like if you have your basin, forgive my drawing abilities, here, then it's not just something smooth that says that as your step size decreases, it becomes kind of like completely entangled in it because these points here actually escape from it. Here you can see them. And you can see little edges here as well. That's because it's not perfectly contained in it. It's actually one of the open questions that still remain in this is trying to figure out exactly what the relationship is between uh, changing h from uh, open bracket 0 up until close bracket 1 and seeing exactly how that affects the way that the basins are structured. Cool. Is this okay? Does this make sense? Awesome. So here we have something else called the Newton flow, which is really similar to it and really does work out in the same way. Wait a second, did I skip something? No, okay. Oh, here we had it. Okay, everything is fine. Uh, awesome. So. Here, a big issue is that things do blow up at the critical points. So a way to try to tackle that is through, oh, let me start from the beginning, actually. If you have your Newton flow here, this kind of characterizes how uh, the points change at every interval, at every step. So here I have them as kind of normalized in their size of the arrows, but here they are all pointed here, 
like go into the root. These are actual solution curves. I didn't draw them here, but of a differential equation going to these points. I'm not explaining that well at all. Uh, visualization of this is if you have these as your three roots, so the function z to the third minus d, this is the roots. So if you think of it in terms of differential equations, these are the constant points, these are whatever they're called. And they happen to become sinks for the function. They're the lowest that it gets. And these poles are, are these critical points become poles for the differential equation. That's why before, when you get super close to it, it kind of throws you away to a different interval when you get super close to the critical point. That's because here, the differential equation is so large, so it throws you. And if you actually realize this, it helps you think of Newton's method. I don't know if you can see the bottom here. No. Uh, that's okay. That's fine. It says, oh, now I have this thing. No, okay. That Newton's method is actually just Euler's method in disguise. So what is Euler's method? It helps you find the solution to a differential equation. So if these are your different arrows, right? Um, representing the slope at that point, then the solution curve, that smooth, will look kind of like this, right? But Euler's method, it goes here, you start, you check what the curve is, you check what the derivative is. So you go here, and then you go here, you check what the curve is. Sometimes it leads you to a similar place, and sometimes it doesn't. But as you're going along this, you get, you follow a path that is always a different curve. Um, a different solution curve. So as you're starting here, you're on this curve, but once you get here, you're on a different curve. And then once you get here, you're on a third one. What this means is that, this is also why changing the step size earlier was actually getting you a more accurate answer, because you get closer and closer as you iterate to the solution curve, since you become, you vary less in how much you're thrown away from the solution curve at that point. Okay. Uh, this is what I wanted to get to when I was here, is that once you understand these solution curves, this is still a big problem at the critical point. So what you can do is multiply it by the scalar factor, 2 times f prime of, or 2 times the absolute value of f prime squared, which will give you the, that thing the vector form of it, representation, which will, uh, examining it. Yeah, so which will give you the same solution curves. The curves will be the same, but it changes the rate at which you go. So it helps understand this as a well-formed differential equation as opposed to just at the points themselves, at the critical points. They're still undefined at the critical points, but instead of jumping so high like this and being very hard to manage, they just become well-defined saddle points for the differential equation. Wait, so how does the uh, yeah. negative gradient, what have you, uh, fix your problem again? Can oh, you so, that? yeah, yeah. It's just a way of being able to represent the same thing that's going on here and here, but with um, treating it as a, treating it in a way that works nicer. If you want to study the differential equation of this, you would go about using that. And these points, which are the critical points, instead of being poles, they would become saddle points. So, okay, I didn't, I always have to study to be able to make a saddle point because I always forget how. But they would become saddle points, why? I don't exactly remember how it would look structurally, but the point of using this, you're asking like what's the point of using this as opposed to the other one? Or rather, how do you derive like two Oh, how do you derive, right, 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 okay. How do you derive how to get this to this or, okay. So if you have negative, I'll try to see if I remember how to do this uh, over f prime of x, and you multiply this by two, f prime of z squared. This becomes a uh, normalization of it. So what it's doing is, let's see if I remember, uh, 
getting this, these two not necessarily cancel, but they get to a point where. Well, I'm getting confused by all of You have this. Of color. 
This is also why here, if you look, it doesn't preserve the exact shape of it. It kind of like distorts and bends it in a conformal mapping. So what you're doing here is uh, kind of bending it to fit the shape, but it still preserves all the angles. Here's your translation, translations count, including rotation, translation, and dilation. Or in this only certain transformations count. Okay. Is this okay to look at? Should I put that down or is it fine? Uh, does this make sense a little bit? Not really at all? It does. It does? Okay, thanks. Thank you, I really appreciated that. <laughs> I need to know if I'm making sense or if I'm just rambling like a maniac. Okay. My anxiety is usually pronouncing this word. Rima. Rima. Rima? Maybe? No? No, Rima. Rima, sure. How would you go about it? Yeah. Rima. Rima? Right. Right? German. You? Riemann? Okay, thank you. I needed to know this so that people don't judge me in their heads and, and just want to kill me every time I say it. Riemann. Okay, so a Riemann uh, surface mapping here, would it be kind of following the same thing I talked about before? All of these are mapped to different uh, surfaces where all of these are considered like parts of the complex plane. No, all of these are individual kind of like individual representations of the of a complete uh, complex plane. So every point in this yellow one here transits to a point on this complex plane. Let's go root here in the middle, going to zero. It has four critical points connected to it, right? Which can, uh, corresponds to four critical points here. And because a conformal mapping can have, or in this case, there's going to be different branch cuts to make this work. Where, let's say you're here, right? And you want to travel from here to here in a circle. You're going to have to go like this and go through the blue and the orange basin. Does that make sense? You're going through blue and orange and jumping through yellow to get there. So if you start at yellow here, you're going to have to go through this cut. Uh, actually, no, this is this one. So you're going to have to go through this cut, which is here go all the way through blue, which goes all the way through blue here. And then you're going through yellow again, because once you get through here, you get through this cut and you go back through it. You go here, which now gets you at orange. You see how these correspond to the same cut? You go all the way around again, and then you get back to yellow. So it follows the same path. Okay. So separating separate tracees become the ill-defined line segments cutting the rest of the basins out and gluing the sides together. So what you're doing here is that you're kind of gluing it based on where the cut starts. And where does the cut start? At the critical point. So okay, an easier example is just look at the blue one. Because that here, this whole thing corresponds to a whole complex plane that kind of gets glued at these edges only. And this is also why Newton's method is so volatile around the branch cuts. Because when you're going around through Newton's method, you start here and then it tells you to go that way, so you just follow it blindly. And maybe that way that it was pointing at, pointing you a little too far, and you go through the branch cut into another basin. Yeah. And Newton's method reads out to student for a iteration, so that it sometimes tells you to go through a branch cut and you just blindly follow it. Does this make sense? Is there anything here I didn't talk about? Straight lines of the formal mapping heads to zero. Oh, right. Okay. So if you have any straight line here, like let's say this is your uh, original point and you go to zero, that's this here is a straight line, but here it won't exactly translate to a straight line. What it does instead is to make a solution curve to this differential equation. So this might go like this because it's good for mapping, so at every point it's going to preserve what's in front of it and behind, which is the line, but the line becomes a curve in the base on itself. Does that make sense? Kind of abstractly. Cool. Okay, so now if you map this to the complex plane, including the point infinity, you can kind of get a better sense of how it looks like in terms of uh, the iterative process. What you do here is every point here, as far as you go away from the roots themselves, 
So this here is a representation of what is. Does this make sense? The no. Okay. So this is the real world sphere. What it represents is trying to figure out a pattern that a function has so that it can be represented with including the point infinity on it. It has another use in complex analysis, the big one, but here I'm just using it as a way to kind of like draw or project the new in the basins. Yeah, the new basins. Okay. So and it's another way to observe how many access points there are to infinity because of how many ways you could get up to there. So let's say, it's hard to see this, but this blue one here has two access points to infinity because it has two ways to get there, right? It's divided by this one basin, so it has two. And here, if you look at it on top, you can see blue coming in through here and another one coming in from this side. This also helps understand what pre-images are, which is basically what I was saying with Newton's method. It's an iterative process. So all of these points here correspond to where this will, all these points here will gate to this point. So this is, so all of these are pre-images of this point, and all of these are pre-images of this point. And then when you're here, this shoots you over here somewhere. Does that make sense too, in terms of pre-images? Um, it will, it's a way of representing all of the points that will gate here. So if you have z to the fourth, you get there through using Newton's method on z to the third. But you also get there from using Newton's method twice on z to the second, or z2. So there are both three images of z4. Okay. So okay, thumbs up from anyone? So, uh, something else here that is another way to represent what these roots look like or what the basins look like themselves is to try to have a conformal mapping to uh, the unit disk. We know this is possible due to something called the Riemann mapping theorem, which says that if you have any subdomain of the complex plane, you can have it mapped to the unit disk. So if a non-empty simply connected open subset of the complex plane exists, then there exists a bihelomorphic mapping to C to take U onto the unit disk. So let's say you have some R that is a subdomain of the complex plane. This can be something as simple as the positive imaginaries. That works, right? Yeah. Uh, this whole thing here can correspond to a mapping onto the unit disk. But it has to be open. And I'm not going to go through the proof of this because this is grad level and I'm not sure I could be able to do it. Probably not actually at all. So we're just going to take it at face value. Is that okay? I know, not very mathy. Uh, so here we're doing this not with any fancy or anything, but we're doing it with a basin. Because the basin itself, if you exclude the critical point, is a Simply connected open subset. We're doing this, sorry, with the connected basin, not the whole basins themselves. The open unit disk. Okay. So here you have a basin. This is your root data. And this is your critical point. Then this can have a conformal mapping onto the unit disk where your root goes to zero. And everything here corresponds to everything in here. With infinity, actually, if you want to go about this also including the point infinity, you can't actually include it in this. But this here is the open unit disk. You can have its representation somewhere on the, on the actual circle itself. So this point here would correspond to the critical point. And then this point here would correspond to infinity. Where here it's just one. Right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So what am I doing here? Uh, if the critical point were to be mapped, it wouldn't be in the open. Okay, cool. But it would be somewhere on the actual unit circle itself. And the number of points of infinity are basically defined by how many access points to infinity there are. So if you go all the way back here, 
one slide pretty far. You notice that the amount of passages to infinity are directly related to how many bases are within it. So here there's two bases in the way of the square one. So there's going to be three access points to infinity, right? Also, there are three critical points, one somewhere here, here, and here. So three critical points, and there's going to be three access points to infinity. This also corresponds to this here. As you have four critical points on the yellow, one, two, three, four, and four access points to infinity, or one, two, three, four, yeah. Is that cool? What's up? I do have one earlier. Are those, are the access points, are those like also mapped to the circle? Are those, yeah, yeah, you can have them as maps to the circle. So here you mean? Yeah. yeah. Really, I'm just wondering, like, is there like other points besides the critical points in infinity that are mapped to the circle? Oh, you mean all the other ones? Better mapped? Yeah, yeah, like, well. Like, not the, not the, you know, open ball, but the. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, not the open. Yeah, 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 inside here, of course. All the actual points, other than infinity and the critical point, are much better defined because they're actually in it. So, like this point here, everything that's actually like yellow itself would be mapped to inside the even circle. Okay, so, so anything that's. So, only the critical points in infinity are on the boundary. Yes, okay. yes. And the actual branch cut itself, but these are undefined, right? So, they're also undefined on the actual circle itself. So, these cuts here. Correspond to these here, but these are kind of like bad points. Also, uh, the critical point and infinity are bad points, or the yeah, numbers of infinity. So, this yellow one, if we were to put that here, would have four critical points. There's an actual way to like put where they're supposed to be, but just bear with me on this picture. It's a picture. So, there would be critical points here. And there would be four axis points to infinity. So this would be infinity one, two, three, and four. But all the actual points themselves, like you were saying, would definitely be mapped inside it and be equal to find. <coughs> so like if you had, if going back to actually the actual Newton's method itself, you have a point here. This will take you there, 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 up until the root. Would correspond to a point here being back to this, to this, and to this closer to the root. Uh, like if you were to start with this point, as this one, and then you iterate it with this method, you get here, you get here, and then closer and closer and closer. Does that make sense? Okay. Anything else? Okay, reinterpreting it, right. So a way to reinterpret a base in here is to look at it, so this is a different one. Now we're, this here is a different basin than this one. Does that make sense? Because this has four critical points, this only has one. Uh, a way that, to imagine Newton's method is to study it only on this unit circle. So you can actually do this with something called a Blaski product, which is a function that can be defined by its zeros inside the unit, inside the unit circle. Uh, it actually has a cool image on Wikipedia that I'll show later if there's time and desire. But we can kind of just talk about the Blaski product here too. So what you want is b prime to equal zero. So the Blaski product b that's going to be trying to do what Newton's method does in the complex plane. But here you're only doing it in a unit circle. So you, why do we want the derivative to equal zero as well at zero? Because if you use Newton's method at a root, right? Newton's method at zeta will give you zeta because there's nothing else to give you. Because uh, that is the point itself that is on a root. Because if you have here x0 or x1 is equal to x0 minus f of x0. And you actually put in a root itself. The output can't be anything but the root itself, because it's supposed to get you to a more accurate um, number of the root. Let me give an example for this with an actual function. Or does this make sense? If you have here a loop, right? So you want to use Newton's method here. You get a tangent line, and you get a more accurate um, 
a more accurate number. But here, what's the derivative? It doesn't matter because your point is still going to get you to zero. Okay, so you want that to equal zero, and you also want b of zero to equal zero because this is where you want your root to be, right? So taking a finite sequence of roots, so these a's are just what, what the roots actually are in the product. A Blaschke product is just going to be multiplying out these values. And so this is the formula for it. If you go and you have a not equal to zero, meaning the root isn't at zero itself, then you get this for the product, or for one of the b values. And if it is zero, then you just get z. So an application to a simple basin with only one critical point. So what I'm saying here is, imagine just a normal, basic basin like this, with a root and a critical point. <laughs> OK. But then it has, and you're mapping this to the unit disk. where this point goes to zero, okay? Now, you want, so what is it? You have b of zero equal to zero. So we have a function here that takes a point and puts another point here. This is b, right? So if you have b at zero and you apply it onto itself, it's just going to give you this point again, okay? And so it has at least one root here. And it's going just off of these two assumptions. That b of 0 is equal to 0, and the derivative <laughs> is equal to 0. Then what do you get? Well, for one, since you know b of 0 is 0, then the root is at 0. So you could just use this definition, and you already know one of the roots is z. So you have b of z is equal to z times the second factor mark. There has to be at least two here because there's a unique critical point at zero. Everywhere else, the derivative isn't going to be equal to zero, right? Because here there's a change. If you're here and you take b, you get to another point. While well, here, it's zero because the rate of change is zero. It just gets you to the same place. So there has to be at least two roots in this because of that. Does that make sense? Uh, and what is the f a function you know? that taking has at least one root here and has this derivative there. Z squared. It actually works out really interestingly that because everywhere in the unit disk, right, that's inside of the, that's inside the disk itself, that's of an open disk, you get a point here, and then iterating on it, you're going to get to a closer one, right? One squared turns into one fourth. One fourth turns into that. So I think this is a really nice way of trying to, another way of seeing Newton's method, that's a way of doing it here. Okay. I think I might have skipped something here. Yeah. So, sorry, I was kind of talking out of left field. Here, a Blaschke product, you're trying to create a function which will be analogous. analogous. I totally know how to say this word I'm thinking right now. To Newton's method inside of this. Instead of leaving this. So what you're doing is you have a value here. When you take it, when you take Newton's method, you get a more accurate one, right? You want something where if you have a point here, you go back, so you go um, the inverse route, you get to this point, you take Newton's method, and then you go back, you can get to this one. So you want something that defines it inside the disk itself. And that can be defined as z squared in a simple I stack sided. In a simple basin. Okay, so now a path looking algorithm. There are different similar algorithms to Newton's method, which kind of utilize very similar properties, but they try to add on to it. So what if we want to trail one solution curve throughout the iteration? Because remember, Newton's method, what you're doing with Newton's method is at every point you're looking at what the derivative is again. So you're here. The derivative tells you, go that way. No matter what happens, you go this way. 
there could be a wall in front of you, which is bad, but you don't care, you're just going. And then here, you look at this again, this tells me here now. Wow, if you're actually using a path, you understand the entire room, and at every point, you just want to say, the path is like this. I don't want to go straight there, I just want to take this path. So I go here, okay, I'm going on the path. If you want to imagine it, let's say you have to get to the Stony Brook Hospital. Newton's method will say, God damn it, just go straight at it. And we wouldn't be able to, we would run into problems. Oh, a path would say, okay, first I have to get out, I have to go down to the door, then I have to go, continue on. You're following some structure, right? Okay. We know the solution curves are straight in the target space. This is what I was saying partially before, is that if you have the actual complex plane, straight things there turn into solution curves inside the basins. So, uh, we know, so it's pretty, and it's easy to make a straight line in the target. So what I'm talking about target and uh, the initial is here. This would be the target space, and this would be the, what's the word for it? Uh, this is called the complex plane, and this is C target, okay? So what you're doing is, once you apply the function itself, we're here f hat to get the unique different um, Riemann surface cuts, is that you're applying a hat. So, what you're doing here, easier if I just draw it out. I just realized I wasn't really doing the chalk. Well, were people able to see that chalk? Okay. So, you have your basins here, right? And these map to a so these are your four roots. These will map to four different planes. Where all of these go to zero. And so these, these here, I know these don't have colors, go to here, where it has one critical point, so it has one critical point. It's called this basin going to this one. This has a critical point here, so this would have a critical point here, let's say. Okay, this has a critical point here, so let's call that here. So these are the branch cuts, and this one would have would correspond to having three branch cuts, one to each other sphere or each other surface. Does this make sense? having the kind of go get cut into the surfaces based on this. And straight lines here, if you just start with a point here, let's say, this would correspond to any point here, f, f of uh, x naught. And if you do a straight line here, like this, that's going to become a solution curve. So this would kind of look like this, maybe, let's say. Okay? And so what you're doing is you can increment it slowly following this line, okay? You're not going to go with different lines based on what iteration you're at. You're going to follow this line, and that's going to ideally kind of project onto a curve here. But to do this, we have to know how slowly we can go so that we don't abandon the line. Because you can obviously say this is, this is what you do, but how do you actually apply this into mathematics? So there's something called the alpha step which helps you figure out the criteria for doing it. So we can limit our function. If so if we consider only polynomials again, they can grab some really useful knowledge. So polynomials, they're very good in terms of, at a point, you can find all the derivatives of it. And that's going to tell you a huge amount of information based on whether it's analytic or not in a small local area. Analytic means just it doesn't have any holes, doesn't have any critical points next to it. Obviously, this means that it depends on the geometry of where you first start off. So here, using this example, let me make that bigger. What you're doing is uh, taking, checking all the derivatives and getting the maximum kind of radius for what you're able to, how far you're able to move.
So here, we're just going to focus on C target. You've got your root here, when this is your zero. You've got your initial point, and this is the one that you may look at. Let's say your critical point is here, just the way that it happens at um, land, right? Okay. Uh, what you do is you check this radius using the alpha stuff to help you, and okay, you go this far. So here you can make a big jump and still know that you're safe. This was proven that this is definitely going to be safe to work with. But then here, when you're here, there's a different, smaller radius, so you have to be more careful. And then here it gets even smaller. And then once you're past it, you can make a big jump again. So it's entirely based on how far it is from a critical point, which you can know by judging all of the values for the, its derivatives at that point. And this is definitely impacted by the critical point by taking the, by dividing it by that, right? The, small, the closer you are to the critical point, the smaller the bottom is. So that kind of impacts how far you can go, right? The larger alpha is, the smaller the step is. So what you're doing here, how do you actually apply this uh, alpha step? is by constantly checking what the alpha is, the alpha value is at a point. I didn't even talk about approximate zeros yet. An approximate zero is a good way of knowing, kind of, intrinsically based on the system itself, whether you have a good enough solution for Newton's method or not. What does that mean? If you're somewhere far away, actually, let me use this word. If you're somewhere far away, meaning uh, your root is here, and you start off here on the complex plane, then you're basically going to be going about half-ish, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, but here, right? The distance that you go. But once you get close to it, you converge quadratically. Up until a certain point, you converge kind of uh, at a different rate, and once you get to close enough to a root, you start to converge quadratically super fast with Newton's method. So what this kind of does is a way of judging whether it is an approximate zero. If it's within this kind of approximate zero radius, then you're going to start doing it quadratically, going super fast into it. And up until then, you're going to be going at a different rate. Okay. Cool. So, also, what the actual algorithm looks like for this path lifting algorithm is you get your w naught, which is foc naught. So that just will be from here. Your actually no, this is the other part. So this here is your x naught, and here is zero. Here is w naught. Where so this is the line that you construct. So this just tells you what direction you're going at w. It just tells you what the value of this is. Divide that by um, the actual absolute value so that you only get the angle that it's going at. It tells you direction. And then it normalizes the rest of it. And this constant is just the constant that is needed that the, that has been found to work for it. You're taking, so for your next W here, that is, at every step, you're constructing a W. So this is the target that you're looking for. Right? So, this comes to here because you're multiplying it by the direction of it that it's going. Whoops. Unbelievable. That's just root of the school. There we go. Cool. Am I going too slow here? Too fast? I don't know. Okay. Uh, so, what you're doing is then here, you're constructing another set of uh, a solution that you're trying to make with Newton's method by trying to find this difference. What you're actually doing by subtracting here is at every point along the way here, you're trying to find, uh, instead of going straight to this, you're actually trying to go to some point here. You don't know what the point is, but you do know what it is here. This here corresponds to what you want, W1. So if you want to look at this with only the real axis, it's kind of easier to show what it looks like. Where here, normally you would have like this, right? And at your starting point, 
you're here and you want to go to zero. So you make a line going straight to zero, right? And based on what the derivative is at that point. Okay? What you're doing here is instead you are finding, you are making a smaller graph based on where you are here and where you want to go. This is W1 or W1 plus 1 is where you want to go. So you want to go here and you want to go here. So you take the difference of the two and you do another root finding solution by taking that. Does that make sense? No? No? Okay. Uh, what you're doing is uh, what you normally do with Newton's method is here and you want to go to zero, right? That's why when you use the equation of the line originally, you put minus zero, right? You have y at zero. Instead of having zero here, you're replacing zero with what you want the next one to be. So here you want it f of x to equal zero. So you want your y to equal zero. Instead, with this method, the path lifting algorithm, you're having zero be replaced by the next step. The next step in the path you want to take. So it would be better if I visualize it. Right, why didn't I do this from the beginning? I even worked out all the steps so I can explain it. What's up? So in the uh, algorithm for finding w n plus 1, what is the significance of the 1 over 15 term? Oh, right. So the 1 over 15 is some constant value you have to use that, uh, when I was reading the research paper for this, the, uh, they found that this constant works, that it always works. So you want to have some radius of convergence here. This is a demonstration of what this radius looks like. That once you find this radius, you still have to go a few steps down. So the steps down is you have to still minimize it a little bit. So that's what the 1 over 15 is. You have to, no matter what you find this value to be, you still have to go 1 15th of that distance. And that will work 100% of the time. Okay. okay. So do you, do you know why it's like 1 over 15 and not any other? It, it, I, I looked at the map and it was a ton of, it's just a ton of mathematics for why it was the way it was. I don't know, but I can just, I can just show you the paper afterwards. Cool. It was one that, yeah. Uh, right. And that explains this step, I hope. I tried to explain it a little better. Okay. And this will tell you a range that 100% work definitely all the time. And so after that, you go here to this step. And this is what it looks like when you actually apply it. So you start with your z naught, right? This is where your root is. And this kind of uh, does here. So this root goes to 0. That x z naught goes to w naught. And this is the line that you make, which corresponds to the solution curve, right? So you want to go to w1. So this is what you're solving for with the algorithm. And you get this z1 dot. Close enough, right, to there. It's always going to be close. And then you want to go here again. So you redo this, and you get your next solution to be here. OK? Yeah, and that's what you get here. And notice that once you get closer to the critical point, you have to be more and more careful, which is why it corresponds to having here. What this means by basins in this image is that even if one of your points or any of your points to you get to another basin in the actual image of, um, like even if it goes into a, a different basin, you're still following this path. So you're going to bounce right back because you're still following the solution curves here. So here, this corresponds, once you get like across here, you go across of the branch cut, but you don't go into the branch cut because you're still following only this solution curve. Does that make sense? Okay, and then another way of being able to find these um, bounds is by something called the newton kantorovich semi-local criteria. Uh, it's just another way to investigate it, but instead of taking all the derivatives of a polynomial, what you have instead are these criteria. So, uh, do, do, do. so for some x naught in a, a domain, so here the domain just has to be uh, what? analytic inside of it. 
uh, 1 over p prime of x not exist, which means that there's no critical point inside the domain itself. And you have uh, these values less than certain numbers. Okay. So what we can do, which what the uh, what the proof is, is creating a major function, which will kind of squeeze an int method into it. And if you have these conditions working, then the new method has to converge in it because of it. So it's kind of is similar to and the way I think of it is if you have uh, some function like this, like let's say this is what your function looks like, really ugly, but whatever, as long as, so let's get it like this, as long as it is dominated by some other function, and this function it always has a root here, then this will always have a root here. It ensures some convergence of it because it creates a function that, is, that always bounds the normal function, in this case, Newton's method. Uh, you don't actually have to use the quadratic equation that he uses, but it's just a way that constructs the proof of what it looks like. You would solve for it, and then that would, uh, the t solution that you get would essentially derive the, how far you can go in each iteration. Okay. Cool. So, here we have one, it is proximity to the critical point. As long as it's not greater than b, then you are a certain distance away from a critical point once, you, once you're close to x, once you're at x now. Here is um, a bound on the step size produced by this method. So this would be kind of like the value of how far you go from one iteration to another, this distance. That would be less than uh, eta. And here it is a bound on, it can be the second derivative in terms of polynomials. It's a lot easier to do this with the second derivative, but it's essentially saying the rate of change of the derivative here for all points x and y in your domain is going to be less than the value that it changes by. So if you have here are your x and y, then and if this is analytic all throughout it, then for all x and y here, the derivatives at the, in this domain are bounded by a certain value, a certain constant multiplied by the change that you can get inside this domain. So you can, this can be considered a second, bounding the second derivative ensures that this is bounded. And you can also construct an algorithm with this by essentially following the same steps that have been for the other one. But instead of using the alpha step, you'll be using some step defined by the cantor of Okay. This isn't uh, completely done. So what this isn't this here, this algorithm is based on testing at each interval whether it satisfies the Cantorovich conditions as opposed to the alpha step, which will automatically give you a range that, auto, that always works, right? The radius from the alpha step will always give you a, will always output a certain range that is proven to converge. Here, instead of doing that at every interval, it checks. So. Whether they're different 
well, there's a difference of the derivatives, which just says that if you're close to the derivative or not, right? If this is very large, then uh, you have to redo it. You have to choose a smaller step side step here, and then you'll get a more accurate response. And this essentially is a test of the, the value of these derivatives, whether they're large enough or not, and a value of the distance between these points. Yeah. Oh, right. And the second one here criteria is doing w prime of n plus one and w n plus one. Meaning, if this is where you want to go, this would be w prime of one, right? This is w naught. And if you land here, and this is your actual w one, then this distance is pretty far, so you failed. You have to try to get a second one. I'm just gonna call this bad. And what you want to do is choose one that's going to be closer. And this would give you one here. And if it's close enough also and it satisfies the other, then it will be good. Cool. So when does this fail? Obviously this will fail when uh, there's a critical point on your line. You're not going to be able to get past it to go to the root at all. You can't do anything about that. Or if it's close to it. So instead of being here, it's here. And imagine this is like super close. Then computationally, there's no difference between this and the previous one. Because you're going to go here, and eventually you're just going to limit. You're not going to get further than this point. You might, if you go like, if you let your computer run for like five years, get past it. Or I might be exaggerating, but it depends on how close it is. And essentially, maybe you just want to test to see. After a certain amount of iterations where it makes no progress, just quit it. Just continue on to the next um, x mod. Okay, does this make sense? To succeed. Uh, wow, I was talking for a long time. I'm so sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, and so this is what a visualization is of using um, the case step, as opposed to Newton's method with a very small step size, that it becomes virtually kind of coincident. And this is the bibliography, so a lot of this was from the images that I got, was from Kim Young, uh, Scott Sutherland, is, uh, also I think he was one who created most of the images. I'm talking about like these images here, that uh, this one these two, and it continues. This here was, image was created from this cool website called David Bell. Uh, other than that, some of the images were from my, this one was also that, that. the ones that look more rudimentary like these, I made, I made that in Python. And this whole project, project wasn't just mine. I made it with a friend in the summer called um, Long, and she was uh, a lot of help in helping me figure this out, and of course, so the was always there to give as much advice as needed in all of those stem sets, pointing me in the right direction, pointing us in the right direction. Thank you. Also, I really appreciate it.